yourself um, as long as you're not speaking and just know that I will live stream the uh, this to Facebook. So, um, if you want to speak, just know that you will be on the Facebook page. And then, like I said, if you're just joining, welcome. Um, I'm going to give for, for folks to get on. We'll probably start at like 6.03, 6.04. Anyone who's just joining, I'm just going to give a minute or two more um, for any any folks who need to get on. Great, right, cool. So I'm going to get the presentation started. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. My name is Nicole Grennan. I'm the community educator organizer with Erase Racism. Um, and today's presentation is about housing discrimination in our lives. Um, please move to the next slide. So um, today we're going to look at some Oh, well, I'll start with it. Race Racism is a regional nonprofit organization which focuses on racial equity in education and housing on Long Island. Our mission is to expose forms of racial discrimination, to advocate for laws and policies that eliminate racial disparities, to increase an understanding of how structural racism and segregation impact our communities and region, and to engage the public in fostering equity and inclusion. Um, and since 2001, we have been mobilizing Long Islanders to successfully expose and remedy racial discrimination and segregation in our region. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about housing discrimination, in case you couldn't tell from the title of the presentation. Uh, we're going to look at examples of housing discrimination. We're going to look at the Fair Housing Act at a variety of levels, so federally um, and more locally. And we're going to talk about some myths and realities of housing discrimination. Um, I'm hoping that you can engage either through the chat or if you feel comfortable by unmuting um, and we'll have some interactive portions, but if at any point you have a question, uh, you can feel free to put it in the chat um, and I'll do my best to get to it. And there's some folks in the waiting room. Cool. This is a show. Um, great. So we'll start with a sort of interactive activity. Um, is this statement true or false? Long Island is a diverse and integrated region. You can put your, you can put your thoughts in the chat or, um, 
or you can unmute. Just know that if you unmute to share your answer, then uh, you will your video will be on the Facebook. Let me let's have a look at the chat. Um, okay, so also no worries if you have to drop off early. This will be saved on our Facebook, but I really appreciate everyone coming. I know how hard it can be to sign back into Zoom after a work day. So, okay, so I see true in some spots, diverse, but not integrated. Exactly. So this statement is actually false, and that's um, precisely why. We are the 10th most segregated region in the United States. Um, and so it's true that we're diverse. Um, we're more diverse than we've ever been, but we're also more segregated than we've ever been. So we're going to have a look now at why that is. How did we get here? Um, this is a short history of Long Island's housing discrimination. So uh, starting in the 1930s, the federal government had a policy of developing housing that was racially segregated. Levittown in Nassau County is an example of this development. Uh, so in the 1940s, William Levitt and his company bought land on Long Island, which previously was an area of potato farms. And within a few years, they were able to develop the land into mass scale affordable homes. They built a total of 17,400 homes, um, which was incredible at the time. Um, however, non-white home buyers were explicitly blocked from accessing this housing, um, including GIs. So black soldiers returning from war also could not access this housing. And there were a series of practices which limited access to the houses, including what it is now known as racial covenants. So um, in the deeds and leases of homes, and we're gonna look at an example of that, there was also a federal policy of racial discrimination that was embraced by banking, insurance, and real estate industries, and there was redlining. So we're gonna go over uh, what all of this means. Um, so in 1960, according to the 1960 census, 0% um, of Levittown's 82,000 residents were African-American. In 2017, Levittown was only 1.73% African-American. Um, so we know that in 1968, um, we're gonna look at the Fair Housing Act that was passed by the federal government. Um, but it does beg the question of if now housing discrimination is illegal, um, why are we still so segregated, especially here on Long Island? So this is an example of a racial covenant. If you have someone who owns a home in Levittown in your life, um, you could ask them to go dig up the original deed. You'll probably find something that looks a lot like this. Um, so a racial covenant is a section of the home or deed that explicitly states that a place refuses access to non-white home buyers. Um, and this is, in, this is largely due to the federal policy that required racially segregated housing. Um, so I'll just read what this says because it's kind of fuzzy. No property in said addition shall at any time be sold, conveyed, rented, or leased in whole or in part to any person or persons not of the white or Caucasian race. No person other than one of the white or Caucasian race. Oh wait, sorry, yeah. So, so what it's basically saying is nobody can occupy this. You can't resell it to someone who's black unless they are um, employed by a white or Caucasian person um, who owns the home. So you can have a servant who's a person of color, but you cannot have, um, the home cannot be owned, rented, leased by a uh, person of color. Um, so that was one way that housing discrimination was uh, perpetuated. Another way was redlining. Um, so redlining is, where the, the federal government created a system of color-coded maps to identify which communities were worthy of government-backed loans. Um, a community with red was considered risky and communities with green were considered safe. And riskiness uh, was not actually based on the resident's ability to pay, but rather the presence of black residents. So these red neighborhoods were denied access to affordable loans and black families were not allowed to live in white neighborhoods. Majority white neighborhoods were identified as safe neighborhoods, even if the area's income or ability to pay was lower than that of the black, majority black middle income neighborhoods. So I'll just say that one more time. Even if uh, the area's income or ability to pay was lower than that of majority black middle income neighborhood, 
a majority white neighborhood was still identified as more safe and green. Um, so this practice was made illegal and we're gonna look at when that was, but its effects are still seen today in racial segregation. Um, and this practice was led by the federal government and upheld by banks and real estate agencies. Um, so if you look, there are even red line maps for the whole tri-state area. There are actually none for Long Island because there weren't enough um, black people on Long Island for redlining. So they, the racial covenants did an effective job at keeping people of color out. Um, so here's another, another activity question. True or false? Black people only want to live with black people, which is why they are so segregated. So you can put your answer in the chat. I see false, false, false. Yep, that's correct. The answer is false. Um, so the, the fact is that actually most people prefer, most black people prefer racially integrated communities. So for the past 19 years, erase racism has documented how housing discrimination plays a significant role in determining the neighborhoods where African-Americans on Long Island will most likely reside. Um, and studies have also shown that even the most affluent black and Hispanic homeowners are segregated into majority black and Hispanic communities with high concentrations of poverty. And studies about neighborhood preferences often pose questions about whether so-called self-segregation is at play by all racial groups, including black people, um, as opposed to structural racism being the reason why we're so segregated. So in response to this assertion, we actually asked a large pool of um, Black Long Islanders about the characteristics they value. Um, our questions included perceptions of their current neighborhood and thoughts about their ideal neighborhood. And we also asked about personal experiences with housing discrimination and the desire to stay in or move away from Long Island. Um, and to do this survey and to better understand the patterns of residential segregation on Long Island, we contracted with the Stony Brook University Center for Survey Research um, in 2011. So this was actually the largest survey of Black Long Islanders to include questions about housing related issues. And the survey respondents were people from neighborhoods in Nassau and Suffolk counties, uh, which had a population that was at least 60% African American. Um, 90% of those interviewed had lived on Long Island for at least 10 years. Respondents shared with us that the prevalence of segregation on Long Island makes it difficult to find for African Americans to find areas with the ideal racial mix. Um, and you can see here on the screen that 69% of respondents chose an even mix of 50% white and 50% uh, black as the ideal mix, um, which is integrated. Um, and actually, the um, a really important part of the study is that only 1% of respondents said that they would like to live in a neighborhood that was all black. Um, so that's an extreme minority that says that they would prefer self-segregation. Um, and roughly four in 10 African-American residents would live in a mostly white community if schools had a mix of black and white students. So um, this is another, another True, false. Uh, black and Hispanic people have lower incomes, and that is the main reason for their segregation in lower income racially segregated communities. Which I see some false, 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 false. That's correct. It's false. Um, so we know black people don't want to live in segregated communities. Um, and the the fact of the matter is that the average affluent Black or Hispanic household actually lives in a poorer neighborhood than the average low income. So while Long Islanders do have different average income levels based on race, it's not true that all higher income white, Black, Hispanic, and Asian people live together um, and that all lower income white, Black, Hispanic, and Asian people live together. Um, and given that Black people prefer integrated communities based on our study, this pattern of racial segregation, regardless of income, suggests that factors other than income are contributing to the high levels of racial segregation we're seeing. Um, so, um, 
let's look at what housing law currently exists in this country in order to um, ideally integrate. So the Fair Housing Act is an act uh, by the federal government that was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson. The Fair Housing Act was enacted on April 11th, 1968 in response to protests across the country. Um, and the law prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of housing against people with specific protected characteristics, which we'll discuss in just a minute. Um, it's part of the Historic Civil Rights Act of 1968. And I'll just read the law states that to ensure that no person shall be subjected to discrimination in the sale, rental, or advertising of dwellings, in the provision of brokerage services, or in the availability of residential real estate related transactions. The idea that unfair housing should be illegal actually goes back to 1866. Um, and on race cases, there are exemptions and they, they get technical, um, but occasionally on race cases, um, lawyers will still plead 1866 violations. Um, if you're not sure if you have a claim, uh, we have some resources that we're gonna put up a little bit later in the in the workshop for you, it's best to contact an agency. Um, so who do you think is protected by the Fair Housing Act? Um, what characteristics are protected? If you want, we, you can um, put in the chat what you think. Who is protected or what characteristics are protected by the Fair Housing Act? Great, so I see race and religion, race, identity, gender, race, gender. Yeah, um, these are great answers. So we're gonna look at some of the protected characteristics the law protects. Um, so the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination based on race, color, sex, religion, national origin, handicap, and family status. Um, Individual states also have additional protected categories as well, and we'll cover New York a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but so the Fair Housing Act had three goals. The first goal was to end uh, discrimination in the renting or selling of homes or apartments. So for example, there is a notice in New York State that discusses your rights uh, through fair housing, whether you're buying or renting. The office or realtor you go to should actually have that information available on fair housing and on your rights as a home buyer. And we're gonna discuss these protections throughout the presentation, but I'm gonna uh, put on the screen what the document actually looks like. Um, so here you see the fair housing notice, which lists the protected characteristics of New York State, um, of which there are many more than the federally protected characteristics. The notice also shares examples of fair housing violations, which we will discuss in a minute. Um, and this document is only available in English at the moment, but um, it will be made available in other languages soon. The notice ends with information on how to file a complaint and information about the offices, one of which is right here in Hopog. And again, this sign must be posted in all real estate broker offices and at all public open houses. Um, so let's look at what acts or activities are illegal under the Fair Housing Act, Federal Fair Housing Act, specifically in terms of renting or selling homes or apartments. And um, again, I'm going to ask you to share your thoughts in the chat. Uh, what do you think is illegal under the Fair Housing Act when it comes to renting or selling apartments? Okay, I see not showing a property, discrimination of any kind, prohibiting certain areas, discrimination of all types of people, including those with disabilities, making decisions based upon protected classes. Um, yeah, so I'll put some of them on the, the board. Uh, refusing to rent, sell, or negotiate for housing, making housing unavailable or lying about availability, denying housing, establishing different terms or conditions in selling or renting, providing different accommodations or amenities, 
uh, block busting, denying participation in housing related services based on your protected characteristics. So that last clause is important. Um, that's the qualifier for all of these. So it is illegal to refuse to rent somebody an apartment because they are black, but it is not illegal to refuse to rent somebody an apartment if they simply can't afford the apartment. Um, and additionally, just because you don't get a specific apartment, that doesn't necessarily mean it's discrimination under housing law. Um, and so that's, again, why we recommend consulting an agency, um, because the burden falls on the, the renter or buyer to prove that it's discrimination. And you have to therefore prove that um, someone refused you um, or made housing unavailable, et cetera, based on your membership in a protected, having a protected characteristic. And this applies to many different types of housing, including single family homes, apartments, and multifamily homes. Um, and there are some other examples that I'm just gonna read through some of them. Uh, falsely denying that housing is available for inspection, sale, or rental, make, print, or publish any notice, statement, or advertisement with respect to the sale or rental of a dwelling uh, that indicates any preference, limitation, or discrimination. Um, it's prohibited, people are prohibited from imposing different sales prices or rental charges for the sale or rental of a dwelling, using different qualification criteria um, for applications or sale or rental standards or procedures, including things like having different income standards or application requirements, application fees, um, those all have to be standardized, they can't be different from person to person. Um, evicting a tenant or a tenant's guest based on their protected characteristic, harassing a person based on their protected characteristic, um, failing or delaying performance or, or maintenance of repairs, um, limiting privileges, services, or facilities of a dwelling, discouraging the purchase or rental of a dwelling, assigning a person to a particular building or neighborhood or a section of a building or neighborhood based on their protected characteristic. Um, refusing to provide or discriminating in the terms of or conditions of homeowners insurance, denying access to or membership in any multiple listing or real estate brokers organization. So I know that that was a lot, um, but again, we recommend reaching out uh, to an agency if you think that you've been discriminated against and um, they'll have all this information readily available. Um, so when it comes to harassment and retaliation, um, Tenant on tenant or neighbor on neighbor harassment is, is prohibited and retaliation is prohibited based, uh, based on your protected characteristic. So proving these claims can be challenging under the Fair Housing Act. Um, something like cross burning or vandalism can usually be covered under the criminal section of the 1968 Civil Rights Act. Um, and severe or pervasive name calling comments made or other conduct based on a protected characteristic may also be covered under the Fair Housing Act. Um, so now we're gonna watch this video from Newsday, the Newsday study that was published in 2019, Long Island Divided. Um, the study found that housing discrimination still happens today at a rate that may surprise us. Um, the video shows us how two different people, a white home buyer and a black home buyer were treated differently by the same real estate agent. And it's also important to remember that both home buyers have the same financial background. Um, so we're going to watch and then discuss your thoughts after. Um, okay. The home buying experience for blacks was a sharply different experience than it was for whites in our testing. We conducted 39 match tests involving black testers. In 19 of those tests, the black tester experienced unequal treatment. That is 49% of the time. Every place I went to basically, they, they treated me very well and they, they showed me that, you know, they were really interested in what I wanted. But it was only after they got back to the office and compared them that we noticed that the treatment wasn't uh, equal. I think what I am surprised at is the sheer discrepancy between the two of us. I like Bitcoin. So okay. a lot of people will say to me, oh, I don't care, I'll take Freeport. It will have the cheap there. I don't care about school because you're going to have children. I said, but you have to protect your investment. 
after looking at the area that she went to and the area that I went to and all the nice choices that she had so much more than I did, I, I felt I was slighted a little bit. As black testers, they were getting uh, directed to more diverse neighborhoods or that they weren't getting equal service compared with the white counterparts. Every time I, I see and hear things like that, I'm still like very surprised. Petri declined to comment. Coldwell Banker stated, incidents reported by Newsday that are alleged to have occurred more than two years ago are completely contrary to our long-term commitment and dedication to supporting and maintaining all aspects of fair and equitable housing. This is a cult well, a young black female tester in a particular test, she was asked for identification proving um, who she was. Well, I do need a copy of your license. Oh, or something, some form of like it. The thing is, because I've gone on so many tests where they have never asked me for ID, well, why would they need ID? Um, all right, but it, this is a uh, routine. I mean, this is something that's not on you. Yeah, no, no, that's what we do with everyone. Because, you know, if you want to give it, you give it. If you don't, you don't. But okay. that's the good, I'm going out. Uh, all right. It's a stranger also, you know, so we just ask for identification. That didn't happen when her white matched pair counterpart went in uh, to the same agent and asked for the same criteria. All of these surrounding areas are great, and they're great for your commute, and they're great for your husband. And Lisa's listings were in more diverse neighborhoods like Hicksville and East Meadow. Her white counterparts' listings were in more white communities. Petrelli declined to comment. Kelvin Toon is a black man in his early 50s, and he went in to meet with an agent involving a test in the Brentwood community, a community that is 80% Hispanic and black. The agent communicated to Kelvin, our black tester, that she enjoyed meeting with clients from the Brentwood area. Every time I get a new listing in Brentwood or a new client, I get so excited because they're the nice people. When we sent Kelvin's counterpart in to meet with the same agent, the white tester was actually uh, warned about Brentwood not being a nice place. The nursery home we need to be near is is near is in Brentwood. Okay. And so we found a couple that are in Brentwood too. Pretty close to each other. Okay. And it just seemed like those would be handy also for going to visit. Do you to want visit. to give me them and I'll look into them for you? Or? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. That warning came later to the white testers saying there was concern about gang activity going on. Hmm. This agent wanted the white tester to know about, but that information wasn't provided uh, to Kelvin. The black tester. The listings centered black tester Kelvin in Brentwood with 27 house listings, while the white tester got zero listings in Brentwood. I mean, she she's telling him these some of the nicest clients I've ever worked with, et cetera, et cetera. He's steering me away from that. And not only in the listings she sent me, but also in telling me that about the, the gang violence. Vickery said she had warned only the white tester about gang activity because she had not been aware of it when she met with the black tester, despite widespread media coverage. She also said her business partner, Jean Gillen, sent the listings to the black tester. Gillen said the listings were unquestionably prepared based on Vickery's criteria and that Vickery may have sent the listings using Gillen's email. She said she didn't know the race of the black tester until she met him later on a house tour. Williams, which was their employer at the time, released this statement. Keller Williams does not tolerate discrimination of any kind. All complaints of less than exemplary conduct are addressed and resolved. What we found when we looked at the total number of listings, agents provided 50% fewer listings to black testers on average than to their white counterparts. So what we see in that video um, is that sometimes even when real estate agent is treating us kindly, they may be offering differential treatment. Um, and it may be impossible to know if your treatment is differential from another person's unless you set up a paired test. But nonetheless, it's important to be aware of strategies that have been used previously, such as steering people uh, to certain communities.
Um, and now we're gonna watch a second video from the same Newsday study. Uh, and this video focuses on denial of equal service. So white home buyers were allowed to see homes and listings, but black, Hispanic, and Asian home buyers face obstacles such as getting pre-qualified or pre-approved for a loan, um, which the white home buyers did not have to face. So we will uh, take a look and discuss that. In Newsday's investigation of real estate practices on Long Island, we discovered that agents engaged in disparate treatment that amounted to denial of equal service. Oh, so that means I can't go out to see anything. I won't, I won't do it. You can try another person, but I don't have to talk. They imposed uh, additional stipulations on the minority testers that they did not impose on the white tester. For example, they would tell minority uh, tester that uh, the minority tester needed to be pre-qualified for a mortgage in order to receive either listings or to get a tour of homes. Um, so you need that. that absolutely. Absolutely. Can't even look at listings or anything. I wouldn't know what to show you. However, that same stipulation was not imposed on the white tester. Is it possible to, uh, for you to start sending me some listings? I can send you, I can send you, uh, listings in those areas. Particularly Blacks were on the receiving ends of this unequal treatment. In one test, Johnny May Austin was the Black tester and Cindy Parry was the white tester. And they met with Anne-Marie Queeley Bichon at Signature Premier Properties office in Cold Spring Harbor. You know, I don't know my way around that here. They asked for the same thing. As often happens, the agent discussed getting pre-qualified or pre-approved for a mortgage by a bank, showing how much a buyer can spend on a house. My uh, husband's working with somebody in a bank, and he will obtain a pre-approval as a mortgage manager. Neither had been pre-approved or pre-qualified. Here's what the agent told the black tester. So I really need that. I want to get any unless I do have a pre-qualification there. So I need to. Well, that means I can't pre-qualify for a mortgage. Oh, so that means I can't go out to see anything. I won't, I won't do it. You can try another person, but I don't have to talk. And without pre-approval, here's what the agent told the white tester. Okay. Um, what is your availability? When can we start working in this? Um, I would say not more. Cindy received 79 listings from this agent. Johnny May couldn't get any listings. Let's see, a woman could Would you rather come to me? And Cindy, the white tester, received two home tours. Bichon did not respond to requests for comment. Another test involved the black tester, Kelvin Toon, who was going to see an agent by the name of Aminta Abarca at Keller Williams in Garden City. You come to white and uh, you sign the commitment. Mm -hmm. Over the course of two visits, Abarca stressed the need to sign an exclusive buyer's agreement. Mm -hmm. If we have a contract, then I'm working exclusively for you. Without the contract, she refuses uh, to take him on a tour of homes. So as uh, Kelvin is driving back from his aborted meeting with the agent, Kelvin's counterpart, the white tester, receives a voicemail from the agent asking him when can he go out on a tour of homes. Hi, David. How are you? This is Amenta. I'm just calling to see if you've started to um, do some house hunting now that the days are over. She ultimately takes uh, the white tester without him signing any kind of exclusive agreement with her. West Hempstead, we saw two in West Hempstead. The yeah. two family one? Yeah. Okay. Right. And then we saw the beautiful renovated. Abarca did not respond to request for comment. Keller Williams national spokesman wrote in an emailed statement, Keller Williams does not tolerate discrimination of any kind. All complaints of less than exemplary conduct are addressed and resolved. I have coordinated more than 12,000 investigations across the country. I have personally done over 1,500 tests. If I go into a real estate office, and I say, I'm looking for a house in this price range. I work for this employer and I make this kind of money. Generally, my word is taken. 
and I'm not asked to show pay stubs. I'm not asked to go get pre-qualified by a lender. I'm not asked to do a variety of things. But an African-American man matched with me may well be grilled about his financial circumstances, may be asked to be pre-qualified. It suggests that um, African-Americans and other people of color are not always taken at their word for what they can afford. In the meantime, I will wait for that pre-approval from your friend or whoever you feel comfortable with. When I get that, I know you are serious about buying. It certainly has major consequences for that person and their opportunity to obtain housing. Perez declined comment. The company Perez worked for at the time of the test, Remax LLC, wrote that franchise owners have taken issues raised by Newsday seriously and are committed to following the law and promoting levels of honesty, inclusivity, and professionalism. A law firm representing Douglas Elliman Real Estate, where Perez now works, said Perez dealt more readily with the white tester because he said he consulted a friend working for a mortgage company, while the Asian tester had talked with a friend retired from a mortgage lender. This point is critical, a firm partner wrote. In seven of Newsday's 86 pair tests, the agent's conduct amounted to a denial of equal service. That affected five of Newsday's black testers, one Hispanic tester, and one Asian tester. Um, so I see some people already putting things in the, uh, in the chat, which is great. Um, Don, you're totally right. This was a really upsetting, but incredibly important investigative series. Um, and Eugenia or Eugenia, um, if you want to be a tester, there are organizations that you can reach out to. Um, and if you want to follow up, I'll put my email in the, in the chat and I can connect you with someone uh, who can train you to be a tester. Um, but so was there anything that surprised you or that stood out to you from that video? You're asking that to anybody? Yeah. I, I feel like it, it, it makes a lot of sense because even when... I have Section 8. It's way worse for me as an African-American on Section 8. They really just, you got to, they ask you so many questions, so many things. Even the Section 8 workers, they seem even more impartial to the Caucasians, making sure they have more um, opportunities for certain housing and even programs that they don't even let the African-Americans or the other minority factions know of. So it's definitely an uneven playing field that we're being, you know, just stuck in the routine, like trying to find, um, you know, safe, safe housing that's affordable, you know. Yeah, thank you, Eugenia. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, yes, Nicole? Yeah. Yes, hi, my, my name is uh, Kevin Lederman, everybody. I'm a licensed, for full disclosure, I'm a licensed real estate broker and I'm also the current treasurer for the Long Island Board of Realtors. Uh, and one of the things I'm noticing about, well, it's pretty evident here on, on the videos about the, the uh, disparate treatment to the uh, individuals, uh, to these testers. However, what's being taken out of context here, which concerns me, is that some of these uh, dialogues have gone under the... Uh, assumption that agents just take buyers out that are not financially vetted. Um, that I take issue with because even pre-COVID and going back to the time period when these uh, tests were done, uh, it's quite common most good experienced real estate brokers will financially vet uh, all buyers. So I think the, the issue here really is disparate treatment. Nobody wants disparate treatment but I just wanna make sure that everybody on this panel understands that agents are not in business to just get a lead off of an internet site and say, drop and take me to this house. The business doesn't work that way. I mean, we have disclosure forms that need to be executed and an agent that's doing their job is going to have a consultation and, and, and find out if they really have a ready, willing and able buyer. This isn't like we're a bunch of uh, Uber drivers and we just take the incoming lead and we just drop and start showing them homes. Because if anybody thinks that, that's like ludicrous. That's not the way the business works. 
Yeah, no, thank you so much for that, Kevin. It's definitely true. It's true that like the, the issue here isn't that they're asking if people are qualified, it's that they're doing it disparately. So they're only asking the people of color. And of course, what's important to remember about the study, which we're, we're going to discuss more, is that they found that 49% of the time uh, in the testing that they did, uh, Black home buyers were discriminated against. That also means that 51% of the time they were not, there was no disparate treatment. Um, so there are, of course, realtors who are following the rules and following them effectively and making sure everyone has a chance at getting, getting right, them. right. And there's one other thing I just wanted to point out, which, in my opinion, is, is slightly flawed with look, Newsday caught a lot of people red handed, that's a given. But one of their uh, measuring sticks really is, is not uh, shouldn't be utilized. They were using Zillow as their source. And that is and anybody who does a test or wants to conduct a test, Zillow, in my professional opinion, is not what you want to use as your baseline. It doesn't make business sense. Uh, Zillow is not the MLS. And actually, things have changed from when this study was done by Newsday, when the investigation was done until today. Zillow used to acquire listings from many different sources. Zillow is now a real estate brokerage, and they have the same listing data that all of the other real estate brokerages have that were mentioned here, Coldwell Banker, Douglas Elliman, even my independent agency, we all have, if you go on and search Zillow and you search one key MLS or element.com and so forth, you're now going to get the same pool of listings. The only thing uh, Zillow has is they have an additional tab that says um, something like additional listings, which has a few for sale by owners and or list pendants, but the list pendants they're not even a listing. It's the a list pendants just means there's a lawsuit that was initiated and the, that particular property isn't even officially on the market. So that's like a bunch of nonsense. But I think that if somebody were to do a study, I think you have to really look at the MLS data that's available to, to all uh, agents, all members of the MLS. That, that would be the more appropriate way to determine how many listings there are or aren't because some of what news they did was taken out of context. They were they were discussing what's available on Zillow, but meanwhile, that's not what the agents do. In our, in our daily life, we don't go to Zillow as our source to produce. Uh, so for me to email you out, Nicole, 15 properties, I'm not going to Zillow to go searching. Yeah, sure. No, yeah. yeah Zillow, Zillow, Zillow was a portal. Zillow was a, is an informational portal, which has morphed into a brokerage over the, over the past six months. So... So we just have to kind of keep that in mind that, you know, Zillow is just that. It's, it's a portal slash brokerage. It's not, it's not where the professionals uh, utilize and, and perform searches and schedule appointments. That's, that's not the purpose of Zillow. Can I ask a question to that? Sure. Because I know I've certainly moved around a lot. Like I said that I have Section 8, there have been times when I, a landlord, they, they want to sell, you have to move. I mean, at one time I moved four years in a row because they felt they weren't getting the rent they wanted. They wanted more money. So, okay, we're going to sell. And then, but when I would call real estate brokers, there was a lot of times they had the same listings I had, but this was, um, I guess, back in the past. I don't know what's going on. Well, I've been trying to move where I am for a while and it's either they, they all don't have any showing for anyone on section eight or it's, they'll refer you to Zillow, <laughs> Zillow or uh, Trulia or whatever. So um, it's, it's really, I know that that's just saying for yourself that, you know, as a professional, but I mean, I'm just going to let you know, not all of them are doing what you're saying. You know, everyone is, I guess they're supposed to be following the standard, but just because you're doing the standard doesn't mean that a lot of other offices or whatever are doing the standard. So that right. as well. Right. Well, let me, and thank you for sharing, and let me just address that. Well, the pro we, if we back up a second, part of the problem on the rental side is not just because somebody has a, a real estate license with the state of New York, and your license isn't specific to whether you're doing rentals, residential, or commercial real estate. Your license is your professional license. It, it covers all types of uh, properties. But the reality is, the majority of real estate agents here on Long Island do not do rentals. So I just, just so we start there, uh, it's really the minority of real estate agents 
handle rentals. So if sometimes you may have a, a, a sales agent that winds up listing an apartment or a house for a friend or a relative or something, they're not as experienced as they should be, for example. And, uh, and that's why when you start talking about section eight, I'm, I'm just gonna give you the reality of it. I, I don't view it so much as um, that there are some agents looking to uh, give disparate treatment. I think the issue is ignorance. I think there are some agents that have just never handled vouchers, never handled section eight, or in other words, if you're going to do something, you need to learn the profession if you're going to do it. And I think th there's an issue of, uh, there's a disconnect. And I think maybe if an agent is then sending the consumer to Zillow, th it's their way of saying, I don't know how to service your request because I'm not familiar with it, uh, which I think would be a lot better if they would just say, look, I don't, do, I'm a sales agent. I don't, I really don't do rentals or I don't have any, you know, that's not my wheelhouse. It's the same as if you went to sell a gas station. If you went to sell a gas station, the residential agent probably doesn't have a clue how to sell a gas station. It's the same thing. So I think they're better off just, you know, trying to direct you to an agent that does specialize in rentals um, and therefore would be knowledgeable of your specific uh, program or needs. Do you happen to know of any? Because I'm on Eastern Long Island and everywhere I call, that's just the same, it's the same dead end. So, I mean, if you know of any real estate or anything that deal with that situation, it would be most helpful because that's what the situation that's coming up, that's an issue. Yeah, I would ask, see, I, I think I would ask for a referral or even if you go into, you know, a chat room online or uh, where, where on the island are you looking? Um, I'm, wait, sorry. I'm, can we? Um... Yes. Okay. No, 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 no. I'm just saying in the chat, in the chat, not saying <laughs> the chat. All right, sorry. No, no worries. Uh, this is, it's an extremely great point. And, um, and the, the reality is that, uh, we have found housing discrimination, even with, uh, in, in instances of rentals, um, like we're going to go over some lawsuits that we've spearheaded and that other partner organizations have spearheaded. Um, so discrimination exists there too. And you, it is illegal under the fair housing act to discriminate, um, due to source of income. Um, which showing you to Zillow might not necessarily be discrimination, um, but it's definitely worth it to raise questions and possibly approach an agency um, who specializes in this and who can help you secure some, some housing. Um, and we're going to put resources up throughout the thing. But yeah, this is great. Um, thank you for raising that, Kevin. And thank you, Eugenia. Sure. No, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, so the second goal of the Federal Fair Housing Act is to end discrimination in mortgage lending. Um, so when we're talking about redlining, uh, one of the reasons it was so successful was that if you lived in a redlined neighborhood, there was no access to affordable mortgages. So discrimina discrimination in who gets access to mortgages and the mortgage rates people have access to determines their ability to pay. Uh, so we're gonna look at what's protected under this part of the law. Um, if it will go to the next slide. Um, so what acts or activities are illegal under the Fair Housing Act in mortgage lending? Um, refusing to make a mortgage loan, setting different terms or conditions for the mortgage, including different interest rates or different fees, uh, setting different requirements for mortgage loan purchases, refusing to make information about mortgage loans available, discriminatory practices and property appraising um, based on your protected characteristics. So that's again, really important qualifier for any of these. So for example, it is illegal to refuse to provide a mortgage to somebody because they are black. It's not illegal to refuse a mortgage to somebody if they simply don't qualify for the mortgage. Um, and this is kind of, again, what Kevin was alluding to is that it's not an issue for a real, real estate agent um, to ask you to pre-qualify it's just important that they do that across the board so that they're asking everyone to be pre-qualified for a mortgage. Um, and then this has to do with mortgage lending. And again, it's it's a similar, um, you can have different requirements for mortgage loan purchases. Everything has to be standardized. Um, additionally, it is illegal for a bank to refuse a mortgage loan based on the racial makeup of an area or community. That is also illegal. Um, so I have another video here. 
and this video um, is from Marquette University in Wisconsin, uh, which and it shows the um, let's see, my Google Chrome. Um, how mortgage lenders across the country discriminate against people of different races. And this is not an isolated case. Um, it does happen here and in lots of places in the country. So we'll watch the video. Mortgage lenders discriminating against minorities. With the help of a Marquette University study, the I team uncovered troubling statistics in the way minority home buyers are treated. Investigative reporter Eric Ross live at Marquette tonight to explain, Eric. Good evening. While well, this 18 page study done by Marquette University reveals lending discrimination on a nationwide spectrum, tonight we're investigating whether it's happening right here in our own backyard. And what we found may, or quite frankly, may not surprise you. I have bought three homes before. I have not been discriminated because of my last name. This doesn't sound like an Afro American. Tracy D. Donatella says her name has helped her avoid discrimination, but for many Americans, that's not the case. It's something that you hear about. Uh, you know, you see news clips, you see lawsuits. Marquette University professor Dr. Andrew Hansen is the lead author behind this study on mortgage lending discrimination. There's a small segment of the market that definitely treat minorities differently. Hansen sent emails to more than 5,000 mortgage loan officers across the country. The emails were similar, asking for information on current mortgage rates and loan options. The only difference, the name of the person sending the inquiry. They each get an, an email inquiry from uh, one white sounding name and one African American sounding name. And then we see, do they treat them uh, differently? The results, black sounding names received few responses from loan officers. For example, emails from Jake Kruger got a response 72% of the time, compared to Deshaun Banks, who only received a response 62% of the time. Loan officers also sent fewer follow-up emails to inquiries from African-American sounding names. Prior to doing the, the, doing the study, what I, what I hoped, what I thought was, what I would find is there's no discrimination, right? This is something that happened 50, 60 years ago. But people we spoke with in Milwaukee are not surprised by the findings. Uh, I don't think it's right at all, but what can I do? You know, I, I think, you know what I'm saying, everybody deserves a, a fair try, you know what I'm saying, no matter the color or race. Discriminatory lending practices during the 2004 to 2008 housing boom resulted in two of the largest cash settlements ever between mortgage lenders and the Department of Justice. $335 million from Countrywide, now affiliated with Bank of America, and $175 million from Wells Fargo. They're doing something that isn't right, that isn't fair. The I-Team decided to copy Marquette University's study with local mortgage lenders. Using one white and one black sounding name, we emailed 10 lenders asking about loans. Ethan Schmidt, a name commonly associated with a white male, received a response 90% of the time. But Jermaine Booker only received a response in 80% of our inquiries. Wisconsin Mortgage Corporation in Brookfield never replied to Jermaine's inquiry. But less than six hours after receiving an inquiry from Ethan, a compliance manager responded saying she was out of town and one of her loan officers would be in touch. The very next day, a senior loan officer followed up. We contacted the company's vice president for answers. He declined to talk on camera, but in an email, he acknowledged inquiries from both subjects were received. But says a loan officer was never alerted to contact Jermaine Booker due to a computer system error. He goes on to say the company is now doing some additional testing to make sure this doesn't happen again. That can still impact a, a home purchase. You're not going to get a loan quick enough, right? And you might not have a real estate agent that's interested or you may miss out on the preferred house. Mortgage discrimination is illegal. Now, if you're denied a loan, you legally have the right to know why. Consumer experts always encourage you to pull your credit report first before applying for a loan. That way you can look for inaccuracies. Inaccuracies in your credit report could result in a lower score. And of course, that could impact whether or not you ultimately get approved for a line of credit to take out a mortgage. Now, if you feel you've been discriminated against in any portion of the lending process, we walk you through who to contact and what to do on our website, just head over to tmj4.com. For now, reporting live at Marquette University, Eric Ross, today's TMJ4. Eric, good information, thanks so much. So even though this video um, takes place in Wisconsin, 
we know from other studies that uh, housing uh, mortgage loan discrimination happens all over the country. Um, and I see uh, Ian, Ian Wilder from Long Island Housing Services is dropping his contact info in the um, chat. So if, um, if you have any questions, if you wanna help with testing, or if you feel you've been discriminated against, you can contact, uh, contact Long Island Housing Services and they're happy to help you. And I'm also gonna put some more contact info up on the screen. So the third goal of the Federal Fair Housing Act is to, um, it makes it unlawful to make discriminatory statements or advertise property that expresses a preference for certain backgrounds or excludes a protected characteristic. Um, it also makes it unlawful to threaten to interfere with anyone's fair housing rights, um, even after a person or family moves in. So it's important to note that even individuals have to abide by the Fair Housing Act. Um, if we live in a single family home or an apartment building, there could be Fair Housing Act lawsuits against individuals as well. So it's not just real, estates, it, real estate agents or governments who um, are liable under the Fair Housing Act. Everyone is accountable. Um, so if you feel you have been discriminated against, make the call. Uh, the burden is on the buyer or renter to prove it. Um, but a fair housing service, the county or the state can help you. They have experts who will help you understand your specific situation and circumstance and will guide you along in the process. Um, and here are some people who you can call. Um, you can take a picture of this screen. You can write down these numbers and I'm gonna put it up again at the end. So if you uh, miss anything and if you registered for this Zoom meeting, I'll also distribute it by email afterwards. Um, so first we have the Suffolk County Human Rights Commission which is the Suffolk County government. Um, and they can take act, legal action against a realtor or agency in Suffolk County. Then there's the Long Island Housing Services and the Fair Housing Justice Center. Uh, both are nonprofit, non-governmental organizations that help people assess their housing discrimination cases. Uh, at the state level, there's the New York State Division of Human Rights. And if the incident involves a licensed realtor, realtor there's the New York State Division of Licensing Services. Um, and New York State actually about a year ago passed a law which would allow for the removal of a real estate agent's license based on discriminatory actions. Um, so I'm going to move on from this slide, but again, I'm going to put these numbers up at the end of the presentation as well. Um, so another true or false question. Housing discrimination was outlawed under the Fair Housing Act of 1968 and discrimination does not happen today. This one is kind of a gimme, so not a trick question. False. Also, John, I see your question, isn't it difficult to know if you've been discriminated against? It's extremely difficult, um, which is why um, there's so much, the Newsday did paired testing, but also how fair housing groups do paired testing um, because that's, an, that's a crucial way to know if you've been discriminated against. And HUD is actually giving more money to organizations who do that kind of work. Um, sure, because I, I would think that if you are going to see a house, and somebody steers you or does some sort of discriminatory practice, you wouldn't necessarily know on your own that the real estate broker was doing something because you're just going as an individual, not with somebody in a pair testing situation. Yeah, in many cases, um, in many cases you might not. And we even saw in the Newsday video, one of the actresses who was doing the paired testing was like, you know, she was nice to me. Like I wouldn't have known that I was being discriminated against if not for the, the partner who also went to the same agent. So um, that's why paired testing is so important. And the Senate also, the New York State Senate just passed 11 bills that bolster fair housing in New York State. Um, and that included some funding for paired testing. So I see uh, a couple of falses and also, haha, we know it's false. Um, and yes, the answer is false. And I'll also just really quickly give voice to Kevin's comment. Agents are required by law to have both the New York State agency form and the anti-discrimination form executed at the first substantive contact with the consumer. It's a disclosure and informs you of your rights. Okay, cool. Um, so the fact is, as we saw the Newsday report, Long Island Divided showed that housing discrimination on Long Island still occurs. Um, 
So even though Fair Housing Act was outlawed in, I mean, fair, sorry, housing discrimination was outlawed in, in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act, um, the Newsday study showed the perpetu perpetuity of residential segregation. So what did the study find exactly? It found that 19% um, of Asian homebuyers faced disparate treatment, that 39% of Hispanic homebuyers faced disparate treatment, and that 49% of Black homebuyers faced disparate treatment. So even in 2019, we continue to see how pervasive housing discrimination is on Long Island. And um, the New York State Legislature has taken a lot of really meaningful steps to address uh, housing discrimination in the state, um, which is which is great. Um, but but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and then some other examples, Erase Racism has done similar testing uh, to Newsdays, but we looked at discrimination in rentals. So in 2014 and 2016, uh, we filed suit with various plaintiffs addressing rental discrimination in Mineola and Smithtown. We found that um, African American renters were being told that there were no apartments available or that there was a very long line, they should come back in a few months, whereas white renters were being shown apartments um, and being helped in so that was to the 2014 and 2016. In 2018, um, Suffolk Federal Credit Union reached a settlement with Long Island Housing Services for discriminating against African Americans and Latinx people looking for information about mortgage loans. And in 2014, the town of Oyster Bay was sued for racially discriminatory affordable housing program. So what basically happened was the town of Oyster Bay implemented an affordable housing program that was only open to people who were already living in the town of Oyster Bay. Um, at the time, Oyster Bay was 3% Black and only 1% of the, that 3% was income eligible. Um, so the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York uh, filed a civil rights lawsuit alleging that the town of Oyster Bay engaged in a pattern and practice of racial discrimination against African Americans in violation of the federal fair housing law. And that is still ongoing. Um, so the Fair Housing, in, in enacting the Fair Housing Act, Congress declared it is the policy of the United States to provide within constitutional limits, limitations for fair housing throughout the United States. Newsday's investigative report, Long Island Divided, shows the promise expressed in the policy has yet to be realized. So Congress directed HUD to make sure that neither the agency itself, nor the cities, counties, states, and public housing agencies it funds discriminate in their programs. The municipalities have the obligation to both identify and remove barriers to address the embedded segregation. Since this was the co was caused by the government, the government must address it. Um, and Congress also intended that HUD programs be used to expand housing choices and help make all neighborhoods places of opportunity, providing their residents with access to community assets and resources they need to flourish. Unfortunately, as we've seen, too many jurisdictions have taken HUD funds, um, but failed to fulfill their obligation to further the goal of advancing fair housing. Um, so moving on to the New York State human rights law. Uh, so we're going to look at New York State and also Suffolk County. We see that the protected characteristics are more expansive than those under the federal law. So in New York State, the Fair Housing Act works in cohesion with the New York State human rights laws to prevent discrimination. As such, renters and buyers in New York State receive a broader range of coverage than renters and buyers in locations without local anti-discrimination laws. So whereas these characteristics are protected under the Federal Fair Housing Act, the New York State Human Rights Law adds marital status, age, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, lawful source of income, military status, and status as a victim of domestic violence. And the Suffolk County law actually goes even further adding group identity, which means, uh, but is not limited to actual or perceived age, citizenship status, gender and sexual orientation. And they also add specifically citizenship status. Um, and there are some additional exemptions which protect senior only housing. Um, but so this is the New York State human rights law and the Suffolk County law. Um, and then to look at some of the exemptions um, under the Fair House, the Federal Fair Housing Act, senior only housing and owner occupied by four, with four units or less uh, is exempt. exempt. 
um, under the New York State Human Rights Law, owner-occupied housing with fewer than two units, and under Suffolk County Law, owner-occupied housing with fewer than two units. Um, so again, there are some exemptions. If you're not sure, contact an agency. Um, any of the agencies that I put on the screen will be able to help you um, to understand your particular situation and whether or not the um, housing that you're trying to buy is exempt from federal fair housing protections. Um, and just as there are different protections at different levels of government, there are various levels of enforcement as well. So at the federal level, HUD and the US Department of Justice are charged with enforcing Federal Fair Housing Act. At the state level, the New York State Division of Human Rights uh, protects New York State home buyers alongside New York's Attorney General. And here on Long Island, we have the Suffolk and Nassau County Human Rights Commissions. Um, and there are also various private fair housing and civil rights organizations throughout our community, such as the Fair Housing Justice Center and Long Island Housing Services. Additionally, complaints and lawsuits can be filed by individuals, um, but we strongly recommend going through a pre-existing organization at the local or community level if possible. Um, so lawful source of income discrimination. Even though people are segregated based primarily on race, uh, families and individuals may face discrimination based on other factors. And one of the most recent protections that was added was a lawful source of income. So often people receive income that does not come from a job. This is called non-wage income. Um, it can include child support, alimony, supplemental security income, uh, HIV AIDS services administration, GI bill housing allowances, and so on. These are legal ways to pay for housing, uh, but they often get discriminated against. So if someone tells you that you cannot rent because this is your source of income, that is against the fair housing law. Um, and if you happen to live in New York City, there are additional public assistance programs that might benefit you with respect to this. Um, in addition, these are there are protections for language access. Uh, so Suffolk County has developed a language access plan as of 2012 which ensures that people with limited English proficiency have meaningful access to agency services, programs, and activities. Um, and even though an, a real estate agent may not have materials in your language, any Suffolk County government office should have the resources available in Spanish, Creole, um, Polish, Portuguese, Chinese, and Italian. And for more information, you can email lep.coordinator at suffolkcountynewyork.gov. So now we're going to um, test your memory skills. We're going to use the chat feature again to share your answers. Um, so in 2019, Newsday found that real estate agents discriminated against Black home buyers what percent of the time? And you can put your guess in the chat. Also, I see that, uh, Kevin, if you have a question, I'll take it at the end. There will be some time for questions. Sure, hold, thanks. On, hold on to it. Okay, I see lots of people getting it right. 49 is the correct answer. Um, and Latinx homebuyers is 39% and Asian homebuyers is 19%. Um, so similar to the Newsday study, we, as we previously mentioned, Erase Racism has conducted paired tests of people looking for apartment rentals. Um, so in Mineola, Erase Racism and the Fair Housing Justice Center investigated a 75 unit apartment complex um, and the investigation revealed federal and county violations of fair housing law. The apartment complex lied about the availability of spaces, gave higher rates to African American testers, and made apartments unavailable because of the testers race. This case went up to federal court and resulted in successful settlements for the testers. Um, and additionally, uh, in a similar test in Comac, Erase Racism, and the Fair Housing Justice Center used paired testers to investigate a 107-unit apartment complex. The investigation revealed serious discrepancies in treatments, such as providing welcoming responses to white testers, while Black testers were lied to and not shown apartments, even when they were available. And this case also went to federal court and was settled by the town of Smithtown. Um, so... Not only is discrimination in housing harmful for what I hope are some obvious reasons at this point, um, but segregated housing also creates public school inequities, school segregation, lack of access to resources, lack of opportunities, 
environmental and health concerns, wealth disparities, and disparate rates of home ownership. Um, and these are all related. So um, regarding public school segregation on Long Island, um, I'm going to transition to a little bit about our education work. So we do work primarily in housing and education, even though, um, of course, there's lots of overlap in other areas as well. Um, we analyzed data from 2004 and 2016, and we found that schools on Long Island are overall more diverse, um, which is a good thing. So we went from 2004, uh, Long Island students were 70% white to 2016, Long Island students are 55% white. However, despite this increased diversity, the number of students who attend majority minority segregated school districts has more than doubled in that same time frame. So in 2004, there were 16 um, majority minority districts. And in two, sorry, in 2004, there were 16 majority minority districts. In 2016, there were 39%, 39 districts. Um, and a majority minority district is one that's 50 to 100% non-white. And for those majority minority districts that are intensely segregated, which means 90 to 100% non-white, uh, the number of students attending has nearly tripled. So it went from 22,000 students to 65,000 students in um, 12 years. The bottom line of the research is that uh, three out of every four black students and about two out of every three Hispanic students attend a majority minority segregated school district. Um, so there is an incredible amount of segregation in our public schools today, which directly correlates to um, housing, both how Long Island was shaped by our, our origins um, and redlining and um, racial covenants, and also how um, ongoing discrimination and lack of fair housing enforcement. So another place where uh, housing discrimination impacts people of color is healthcare. So white people on Long Island have died at a rate of 95.3 per 100,000 people from the COVID-19 pandemic. The age adjusted rate of death for black people on Long Island is blank per 100,000 people. Um, and again, you can put your guess in the chat. Okay, I see 300, I see 98. 275, 250. So the answer is 229.1. Um, so if you think about Long Island's population, we're about 63% white. Um, so we're majority white. So this number uh, doesn't really make sense. And of course, healthcare is related to housing in a number of ways. It affects what education you get, which affects which job you have, which affects your likelihood to have healthcare and or to be a frontline worker. Um, and that's just one way. There's all different kinds of ways we can look at it, like food access, um, proximity to healthcare centers, and so on and so forth. So we can see that segregated housing creates a lot of problems in a lot of different areas that might not be obviously related, um, but certainly are. Another one with healthcare and also environmental concerns is if anyone is following what's happening in um, Brookhaven with the Asheville. Um, residents who live near the Asheville have the lowest life expectancy on Long Island, and it's about 10 years late, uh, lower than the average life expectancy for people in New York. Um, and of course, the community around the Asheville is majority um, Black and Hispanic. So if you're interested in following what's going on with that, the town of Brookhaven, I think, actually said that they were not going to build a second landfill. So now they're figuring out um, what they're going to do with the with the garbage um, but you can look at blarg that's the group that's been doing a lot of organizing and advocacy around that um, so i hope at this point that we've been able to illustrate the detrimental effects of segregated housing um, and on the flip side it's also important to note that there are benefits proven benefits to integrated communities um, in education in healthcare, and employment and in personal wealth creation while this is a large systemic issue, we can all play a role in helping to dismantle these patterns. Um, and often people might be hesitant to take action and raise their voices, especially with an issue like this. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot at stake for our communities, for our children and for you. And it's really about building a, a better world for everyone for generations to come. 
So again, just to reiterate, if you feel you may have been discriminated against, you're not sure, reach out, uh, make the call for help. Um, it's important to speak up for ourselves and also to speak out against any housing discrimination we may witness because if we experience housing discrimination, we're probably not the only ones. And I'm going to put the numbers again on the screen um, so you can feel free to write them down, take any questions, uh, write them down, take any pictures. And while uh, that's the, the end of my information for you, so I'll take any questions. And I know Kevin. Kevin had one, so we can start. Sure. Thank, thanks, Nicole. Well, th two things. One of one of the things that I keep when you had the chart up going over the different levels of protected classes on a federal, state, and local level is I think it adds to some of the confusion. Well, first off, I mean, people shouldn't be discriminating, period. But I think what what would be really great to, to streamline this would be if it seems like Suffolk counties is more uh, strict, if the state could adopt the stricter standard and even if the federal um, standard could be raised because having all these different, especially here in the metro area, because we've got the city of New York, then we have you know Nassau and Suffolk and then uh, the rest of New York state. So I think if, it, if, if, if there was a possible way to um, put these, these laws in sync with each other, I think it would be easier to carry out the mission, uh, number one. And number two, just getting back to all the comments about you know the rentals, I almost think it'd be good to have a directory as opposed to going out to the masses of real estate agents. If there was a directory with agents that specialized in rentals, that would be helpful in some way, shape or form, just because at least you're, you're because I feel like the public is, is just going out there to, to the masses of agents. And again, the majority of real estate agents don't handle rentals. And that's whether that's whether or not it's with any of these programs or not. You know what I'm saying? So, so it seems to me there's a disconnect where the public's trying to get housing. They're contacting all of these agents um, who, who may not have, may never have done a, a rental transaction in their whole career. Yeah, so the, I mean, the testing that we did was with real estate agents who did rentals, and we found okay. that there was disparate treatment depending on if they were white or black. Gotcha. That was definitely an instance of disparate treatment. Um, I can't oh, and I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying it's not. I, I'm just. I'm just trying to listen to some of the comments from some of the people on this uh, meeting, and 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 their experience. And I'm I'm just trying to say. Well, it's terrible. If you're finding people, agents that are really specialized in rentals, then you experience it. That's terrible. But at least trying to find somebody that can help with the subject matter is, is all I was trying to get across. That's all. Yeah. No, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, that's a crucial, crucial part of, uh, crucial part of it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, if, if someone doesn't know anything about rentals, then that wouldn't be discrimination. That would just be that's not their no, but it's it, well, they should really direct. I, I, I think a lot of agents at least try to point the consumer into a better direction or at least refer another agent that is knowledgeable. Yeah, that would be that would be the, the logical thing to do. I guess even if they don't do that, as long as they're not um, treating if someone comes to them section eight voucher versus if someone comes to them with in income, if they're treating those people differently and referring one person to, then that would be disparate treatment. But if, if across the board, they're just saying go to Zillow, then that they're just not being helpful. Right. Hi, Nicole, this is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you go, you go, I'll go after you. I'm just saying, but if you're coming across that with several different real estates that you're contacting, you can't say everybody isn't trained in rentals when that's usually the first thing you ask when you call is, do you do rental? If they say they do rentals, I mean, they obviously should have experience or have something to be aware of. I feel like at this point, a lot of people, and I, I don't mean to sound judgy or whatever, but everyone's trying to cover themselves. Like now they're even asking you to fill out the national registration thing, which is like 50 bucks, that's non-refundable, and that's per listing. And they're also asking you for credit checks, which says your race on there. So it's still a catch-22 on the racial disparity. So I just say that 
rent has gone up and tripled since COVID because now they can be very selective. So that's made it even worse. So this whole thing with the race, the race thing that she was saying, it, it counters into everything, healthcare, job. It's just a mess. And I mean, everybody's trying to find ways to skip around it into how to, to, to beat around behind the system. So it's not benefiting people like us, the little people who really are at a, dis, a, a disadvantage. So that's the point I just wanted to make. Thank you, Eugenia. And I want to add that another part of our work with fair housing is trying to get more affordable housing built because another big problem that our area faces is that there just simply isn't enough affordable housing. Um, what makes housing affordable is if you're spending um, a third or less on your on your housing costs. Um, there are lots of people on Long Island who that is not the case. Um, housing is extremely unaffordable here. For, for a large portion of the population. Um, so if you're interested in possibly helping us to advocate for affordable housing projects being built, then you can also reach out to me uh, and I'll drop my email in the chat again because um, that's another initiative we're working on. It's just getting more affordable housing built to begin with. Great. Hi, Nicole. This is Eileen. So that's exactly. So I'm, I'm attending this not only for myself, but also representing some volunteers from the Sid Jacobson JCC. So what can volunteers do to help advocate and raise our voices? Um, I would say, I mean, you can reach out to me and I can give you some more specific things. Um, but if you hear of an affordable housing project that's being planned for your area or even your town, um, like something simple like calling the town council people and saying that you support affordable housing, um, you support more than like 10% of the housing developments being affordable because that's another thing is like in a mixed use development sometimes they'll just have like 10% of it is affordable units. Um, and so simply expressing that you support that in your community is a huge is a huge step um, because there's a lot of you know like not in my backyard rhetoric um, even though there's many proven benefits of having affordable housing um, so that's one way and then another simple thing that we always say people can do is even if you see um, like a house for sale on your street call the realtor and say that you want them to sell that house to anyone who wants to buy it um, no matter what color, source of income, race, creed, et cetera, um, say that you, you support you know, fair housing and um, you welcome anyone who wants to buy the house. Something as simple as, as, simple as that. And then um, besides that, like, you, you know, um, I'll try to think of some other things, but um, I would definitely say advocacy is a big thing here because there's a lot of myths about affordable and multifamily housing um, that simply aren't true, but that lots of people have nothing else to compare it to. And they it's not their fault. Like they've learned these myths and no one has corrected them for a long time. So um, it, it, it doesn't have to be too, too hard to help and raise your voice. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but I'm, I'll stay on for any more questions um, between now and 7.30. And you can put it in the chat also um, if you have questions and if you don't want to, if you, if you unmute, you will be on the Facebook live stream, as I mentioned. So if you don't want that, then um, you can definitely put it in the chat and I'm happy to address questions there. Nicole? Sure. I'm going to ask a loaded question. It's uh, Kevin here again. Uh, what is your consensus as far as the situation here on Long Island improving uh, or not? Um, I would say that the New York State Senate just passed 11 really fantastic bills um, that are aimed at reducing housing discrimination, which of course is an important step. Um, and it seems like more people are interested in having discussions about affordable housing, especially as more and more people are finding that their own housing is becoming unaffordable. 
Um, but I don't know. I, I don't know. Did that answer your question or what's? Well, I, I'm talking about like like the the, the discrimination. Uh, you know, and, and well, as far as far as we all know, we're we're too segregated. So as far as getting Long Island to be more segregated, are are we make? How, how would you say the progress is? To be I more. Mean, is, and, and the pace of it is are are, are 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 you winning the war or is it? Or is it getting worse? Is is kind of what I'm trying to ask. Um, the percent, or maybe not just with you, maybe the public's perception, or or whatever. Yeah. So I would say I like to believe that it's it's getting better, especially now that we have legislators who are taking an interest, and in large part that was due to the Newsday study, because you know we had done studies before the Newsday study um, that had demonstrated similar discrimination. But having something that was like so public and garnered so much public attention right. um, really helped to move the Senate along. And they actually had a, a couple of hearings. They had one hearing in December of 2019. They invited all the realtors and none of them came. They had another hearing in September of 2020 when they subpoenaed the realtors. And of course, then most of the realtors came. And pretty much every realtor said that they didn't believe that they dis they discriminated. You know, like the... The Senate would play the video. It's clear that they said- yeah, I, I saw that, I saw yeah, that. that. That broke fair housing laws. And then they would say like, no, that wasn't my intention. And of course, intention doesn't really matter. It's all about impact and whether you broke the fair housing laws. And like in many cases, they explicitly did, um, but there had been no repercussions from, from up above. Um, they all still had jobs at the time. So that so at that point it seems like no, but now that the New York State Senate is taking action and the bills are now in the assembly waiting legislation, um, I mean that's promising. It's always promising to have like stronger legislation that prevents people from being discriminated against and holds realtors accountable. Right. The only thing I wanted to comment there is I don't know if everybody's aware, but the New York State uh, Division of Licensing Services they have cases outstanding. On some of on on se several of those agents, so so that's not over. Just because it was done and uh, that investigation ended, I think in 2019, there's different um, entities that are here still dealing with cases. So that that's not over yet. That process is not over yet. Yeah, no, definitely, it's far from over. Um, and hopefully, the new legislation help is preventative and. Um, prevents people from discriminating at that scale that Newsday, Newsday's report found. Um, Thank you. But yeah. I would like to say, Nicole, that I remember they did a study similar to this back Newsday back in the late 90s, had to be the early like 2000s. And it was the same thing. They sent testers, they were shown that there was racial disparity. I mean, it was like almost a mirror image when they did this recent study. And it's like, nothing's changed. I live in Longwood School District. I'm on a couple of committees here. And there was an in-depth discussion about it. Uh, they're making mention that they don't want any more low-income housing. You know, that's going to bring our property value down. We don't want any more of those people, that element. This is what they use, that element moving into this area and disrupting our children, X, Y, Z. And I called them out on it. So I'm like, are you, element, are you talking about African-Americans and minorities? And everybody got quiet because it was a Zoom call. But I'm like, I, I said, I just want you to know those same people who are living in Win Quorum, they want the same thing that you want for your kids. They want a good education. They want safe housing. They want those things. I said, some of those people are probably never on a home with all the things going on right now because the housing market is going way up. My daughter just bought a home. It was listed for 469. She paid 520. So I mean, it's 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 not. It's like a delusion of, oh, it's getting better. No, these people are sitting back in their homes and feeling how they feel, and this is how they feel. And unless, you know, you know, you can't change what someone thinks, but the sad part is the powers that be, a lot of them think the same way. So that's where the wall comes. So it's it's like a push and pull, pull and tuck, I don't know. But um, it's just not good. Yeah, no, it's definitely not good. And a lot of that uh, rhetoric of like, oh, it'll bring property values down, that's like born of blockbusting, which was a process 
um, where realtors would tell white homeowners, oh, like lots of black people are gonna move into this neighborhood. You should sell your home right now. The property values are gonna go down, even if that was completely untrue. The white homeowners would sell their um, homes for less than it was worth. And then the realtors would resell it um, to black home buyers for more than uh, it was worth. So that process was made illegal. It was happening in, I think, the 60s and maybe the 70s. Um, but uh, that rhetoric still prevails of like, oh, if people who have affordable housing or multifamily housing, that's going to bring down the property value. Um, low income or whatever source of income that will bring down the property value. Um, and that's not true, um, but it still affects people. But that's why a lot of our work right now is sort of just getting everyone on the same page of like re literally re-educating people about what affordable housing actually means and also how it will benefit our entire region. Because I think I saw a study that like 55% uh, of people aged between like 22 and 34 are thinking about leaving Long Island in the next five to 10 years because of the cost of living. Um, I would double check that number, but basically a huge number of young people are thinking about leaving because Long Island is so unaffordable. Mm -hmm. um, and what will happen then? Of course, like, you know, the economy would crash. Um, and so it, it benefits everyone to have more people who can afford their homes. Um, but many people don't learn that or are, aren't exposed to that, um, that narrative and that reality. So, but I, I mean, it sounds like you're doing incredibly brave and strong work, Eugenia. Um, but my brother, I have a brother and a sister. They both have jobs. They've been sleeping on people's couches for five years. They cannot afford the rent. They don't have the broker's fee. They don't have the security because people want broker's fee security and that. It's like, and they both work. And it's like how they, they don't, and then when they say, well, you're a brother and a sister, you know, you, you, we don't want that. No, it's like, they, 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 they have, it's like, where do they go? They can't afford anything. They don't have children. So they're not, uh, they don't apply, you know, for programs with this, anything. It's like, what do they do? It's, it's like so disparaging because how do you tell someone that you're working that you're homeless? And they feel like, well, you're sleeping on someone's couch. No, you're still homeless. So that's not your home. So it's, it's very, there's, there's, there needs to be more of something around to help people because people are really suffering in this situation. You have people on Section 8 who are living in a shelter and they have a program voucher, but they're in a shelter because they can't, because HUD does not pay the rent that that's being asked. They pay like 600 less. So it's a, it's an all around just mess that's just going in circles. So, I mean, something needs to be done or, or re reiterated. I don't know what needs to be done, but something has to happen. It's just bad if you don't have any money. No, yeah, it's it's definitely bad. And it's going to affect our whole region. There is, I see it, I see now. Oh, sorry, hi, Barbara. You, you need uh, my contact info or Ian's? I, I just see it now. Um, well, either one, I just wanted to know more about the co-op law in Suffolk County disclosure law that I was just told about, because that's one of the biggest ways I, I hear that people get around the housing um, issue, so to speak, with the co-ops and the condos, they have such a careful way of how people even get to see an apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I would reach out to Ian uh, first, and also Eugenia, you might, uh, it might be good for you to reach out to Ian too, I don't know if you caught his contact info. Um, but yes, I did. I, I screenshot it. So I will be getting in touch with Mr. Ian. <laughs> okay, cool. Great. Are you still looking for testers? Um, I, Erase Racism isn't doing any testing at the moment. Um, we're looking for, oh, but I see that Ian has a, a thumbs up. So definitely reach out to Ian. Okay. Um, and what we're looking for right now is we're looking for people who are willing to help us um, advocate for affordable housing in their communities. Um, so. And what would that look like, Nicole? In addition, just calling real estate people saying we want people on our block or in our neighborhood of all different sizes and shapes. Um, that would look, we're not totally sure what that would look like. We're kind of figuring it out because um, there hasn't been a lot of work like that done on Long Island. Um, but ideally it would look like 
you or whomever like mobilizing your community to really push for like yes we really want affordable housing in our community um because what really needs to happen is like that the legislators need to believe that their constituents want it um and value it and see it as uh important so getting that done thank you no problem um anyone else any questions You can. Great job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Very informative. I will be in touch. Great. Thanks, everyone, so much for coming. I dropped our website in the chat. You can also follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and uh, I hope to see you all soon in one way or another. Thank you Have so a good much, evening. Nicole. Good Bye, Nicole. Uh, Nicole. Bye, everybody. Nicole, quick question. Sure. Uh, can we view this? Um, what was shown tonight is.